Hey there, everybody. It's Tom. I just wanted to tell you about this episode that we're going to be doing today. Today's episode is actually a replay of our Clarified Realty podcast happy hour that we did a couple of weeks ago at the WeWork in Burbank uh, with our good friends Vahan Papian and John Ailes, uh, actor extraordinaire from shows like Bosch and Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. And it was really informative, and it was uh, I thought it was really good content for you guys to hear. Um, basically, we're talking about about freelancers, the world of freelancers, and how freelancers can you know, make it work when they're not working at all. Uh, and also on top of it, you know, finding ways that they can, if they should want to buy a home, how they can get in, uh, get a lender to, to, to give them approvals, even though they don't have uh, a, an employment record. Uh, and it's, it's a really fascinating, really good uh, episode. And I just want you guys to listen, and I hope you guys like it. And if you have any comments or any questions, you know, no, just leave comments down below. We're, we're always listening and we'd love to hear them. All right. So here we go. Here it is. The Clarified Realty Podcast Happy Hour. The Clarified Realty Podcast, exposing the real estate secrets your agent doesn't want you to know. Here's your host, Tom Clary. We're here, Clarified Realty Podcast, happy hour. How's everybody doing? We actually have a little bit of an audience today. It's fantastic. So glad everybody could come. Uh, we might as well go ahead and get started. I wanted to introduce everybody today um, up here on the dais with me. I'm going to start over here with the, to the person to my left, Vahan Papian. How are you, sir? Good to see you. CPA extraordinaire. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, a CPA's role in working with freelancers and uh, really trying to maximize their deductions as they uh, go from job to job to job. I mean, really, this is what we're focusing on is people working in the quote unquote gig economy. Uh, and speaking of gigs, I'm here with a very, very good friend of mine from a long way back. 1985. 1985, 30 years ago, and I know this because we just had our reunion last weekend. But Saturday night. But neither of us went to it. Why is we, that? We didn't go to it. Uh, but John Ailes. John Ailes. Shout out to 1987. Hi, Nice school. to see you guys. Sorry uh, we didn't come. I missed the date somehow. Yeah, I don't think that was my reason, but, <laughs> but uh, I had kids. I have kids. Uh, so that's always the excuse yeah, you always use too. when you're, when you've got kids. It's like, I can't do anything. I've got to, <laughs> I have two kids at home that will tear apart the house. I'll just leave them there and take my wife and yeah. But John's, uh, but John is, uh, is by no stretch of the imagination, a working actor. Uh, John has been in some uh, amazing uh, work you were in I mean, all the way back. I mean, with, I mean, gosh, Nutty Professor. You were a Nutty Professor, uh, the very you know big part with Eddie Murphy, and uh, then like recently you were in Sex, Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll with Dennis Leary. True. That was uh, you were Rehab. True. And it was awesome on that. I loved True. watching that on every FX. week. Yes, on FX. That's right. Um, and uh, you were also on Bosch. The show Bosch, which Third uh, Amazon season. original, correct? That's right. You could tune in right now. You could go. Well, don't do it right now. But if you are an Amazon Prime member, it's you, free. You can go see John <laughs> right now. So, um, uh, and we also, as always, have our good friend and regular co-host, Ron Bruno, everybody. How is it going? Ron. Ron. Hey, hey. There he is. We're, we're here in Burbank. We're in Burbank. We decided to do it a little bit different uh, this, this time, and I think this uh, might be uh, the place we want to keep on coming back to. I mean, you can't the see it out there. The view here is insane. incredible. I'm looking out over Warner Brothers' lot. And over, uh, I mean, over there, too. yeah, you could see, you, you could actually see the Harry Potter castle from here. You can see Hogwarts. Yeah, this is the Burbank Hills. This is the exact view that my dentist looks at. Really? Nice. Yeah, they're down there on the floor. I'd hope he actually looks at your mouth, <laughs> <I'm> but. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's not like. Surprisingly, no. 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 He's blind, but he. <laughs> blind. That's good work, though. He's fantastic. He's great. 
Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a lovely place. So I'm, I'm glad everybody could be here. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully you guys are joining us on Facebook Live. I want to encourage everybody that's out there right now to, uh, if you have questions, uh, we have behind us even some great uh, real estate professionals and experts. Uh, we have Tim Denton, who is a uh, financial planner. So if you have any financial planning questions, uh, he's going to be here uh, for, uh, for a little while. We also have some gentlemen here for P P from PCV Mer Merkur. Merkur. Fantastic, the appraisers. If you have any appraisal questions, uh, uh, they're here, and we can definitely field those. Um, but why don't we go ahead and get this, this uh, uh, the conversation started uh, with what we're really kind of talking about today. Uh, the topic is uh, freelancing, how to make it work even if you're not. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to probably start here with John. And, you know, you, I mean, you consider yourself, I would, I would assume at this point, you, you, you consider yourself a working actor. Right? Yeah, that's always hard. That's always hard to even sit into. But yes, I mean, I am a working actor, and it's hard to even get to a place where I mean, there are so many actors out there who uh, who work at a craft all their lives and and have a hard time getting into meet agents and get a play, and those kinds of things are yeah. hard to come by. But uh, as soon as you get paid, uh, you know, as soon as you get paid, you consider yourself a working actor. Sure. And then sustaining that is the beauty of the... Going from job to job to job. Right. And really taking the leap that that is the thing that you're going to lean on. That's... Uh, have, have you noticed anything change in the way you kind of approach the career now at this point? Well, the or business is, it... is very different from when I first started. And when I first started, I was in my 20s. I had just come out of school training to do it. It was the only thing on my mind. There was no family to support. And so, you know, when you keep your expectations and your, and your expenses low, yeah. it's very easy to take that leap of faith and, and believe that right. the next thing is coming. Right. Even though, in the very earliest stages of my career, two months not working, you, you itch. You just yeah. want to be out there doing it of so bad. So, I mean, I know what artists feel like. It's like all you want to do is earn your keep doing what you want to do. Right. Uh, what well, so, you were trained to do. I mean, you, you, right, you, exactly. you went to Rutgers, right? I went to Rutgers. Rutgers. Got a BFA. BFA. I mean, that's really, you spent that time, that money, right. that investment. It's kind of like... Came out with loans, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But Debt. that's, but it's like if I'm, why, why would I not do it at this point if, if I've invested well, this much? Certainly that. In, yeah. My parents thought I studied business. We're, is that true, really? Well, the first two years, the Cal State Northridge, they actually did. They actually did. But I was starring in all the plays. What the hell were they thinking? Yeah. yeah. So, so now that you're you're out there and you're you're actually you know going from you're 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 bridging those gaps. Right. Fine now. Right. Are, are there issues that you kind of run into time and time again in those gaps in terms of like this is a this seems to happen all the time to me. Well, it's hard. I mean. There's two ways of looking at how you get work as an actor, and if you look at it from a business standpoint, it can really do you harm. The thing that you want to do, and I think it's true in any craft and probably in any freelance job, is you just want to do your very best work every time. Right. Uh, because then you build confidence in yourself that you're going to deliver when, it's, when, when the time is right. Yeah. And build relationships who, it may not be that this is your job. You, right. know, you may not be right for this job, and this is probably true for musicians, sculptors, you know, uh, people who do anything in, on a freelance, in a freelance world, but laying the groundwork for the, for the future is really important. And of course, you're talking about financial gaps, which I'll let yeah, we'll you talk speak about to, yeah. uh, because investing whatever you do come up with is probably the most important thing that you can do. Yeah, um, and making those little pots kind of last, basically, those pots that you get. Right. Because, and, because actors, they don't go every single week. There's my God, no. a couple of months and then, you know, no, then maybe I, a whole bunch. And, I know a few actors who are, seem to be on a plane every week. Those guys, and those guys who you would know by face but not by name. Yeah, right, those you know, kind of character, quote unquote, character actors. Right, and I fall in the gap of character actors for sure, uh, but it's really important not to go out like trying to make a killing. You really need to just keep sustaining until it starts to shine on you that maybe, maybe this is a way to build 
you know, from one level to the next level. Right. But if you try to go out there and make a killing and it's about getting paid, it is always going to do you harm in the room of trying to get the job. The, yeah. part, the point about the freelancer is you're always trying to get a job. Yeah. You're always trying to find the next bit of work. Right. And you can get lost in focusing on what's happening now. You right. Know, you really want to focus on how to do this work well. Make and, it and I, I think, and then I, I want to get to that because I think that that kind of leads into a conversation of how you spend your day. I mean, literally, right. in, you know, the percentage of your day, what is the percentage that you use trying to find another job right. compared to the actual doing of the job? Do you put a lot of focus into, like, on a daily basis? I need to do X, Y, and Z. For I think my... I made mistakes earlier when I had a family. The the putting a roof over my family's head. I had been making a great living as an actor just until I had a kid. And now that onus was weighing on me a bit. And I feel like I was going for that kill. And I remember an actor turning to me uh, at some voiceover thing and saying, are you putting 40 hours a week into this? Mm. Yeah. And I was like, well, no. I mean, I don't think I need, he's like, well, you know, is it our profession or not? You really have to maybe do more than 40 hours a week. You need to find a way to fill that extra time. Now, I'm not saying that that's even possible as an actor. You're really at the behest of, are there roles being written for you or not? And if they aren't and they aren't coming your way, then you may have to get clever in creating right. your own work. Right. You know, so to your point, yeah. I wear 18 hats. I'm a photographer. Yeah. I was a photographer in college and as an amateur. I became a professional when my kid was born. I did a lot of portraits and stuff like that. So I built that portion of my artistic kind of world and then started to lean on it to make a living. So I started to shift between doing those two things kind of on an equal basis. Yeah. Now I'm back to mostly being an actor. I'm right. a documentarian as well. But Now, I, I want to kind of interject here because it's, it's something I, I really have to say because it's, if they have the opportunity, everybody uh, take a moment. Uh, even if you're listening to this in the podcast, uh, to take a look at some of the work that John has done. Uh -huh. It is some of the most remarkable photographer. I consider myself a part-time photographer very as good well. Photographer. But, but your work is like, I remember seeing it for the first time and I knew how amazing it was by how much I hated you. <laughs> I was like, literally, I, I despise this son of a bitch. That he grew up, uh, we grew up together and, and I never even knew he had it in him to then see um, the stuff. We tell people really quickly before we move on, I want, I want everybody to hear, where would be a good place they could see some of your stuff So while we continue this conversation? Strangely, as I, it's just been reported to me that my website is not even up. So you can go to my Instagram account at Jackass. I'm a Jackass Dog on Instagram. At Jackass Dog. Um, I'm JohnAles.com as well, but if you go there, the photos aren't even showing up. So I don't even know what to tell but you about that. To, to say that you're, you nurtured that part of your creativity right. is it's sort of an understatement. Did you ever find yourself kind of leaning too much that way? Or yeah, like, I mean, and like, oh, maybe I need to, to not be... I was shooting film, and it, it, photography came to me as a real like professional passion during the crossover into digital, where it became something I could do as an autonomous gesture. Acting is the kind of thing where you are really captive to the material and the buyers. Yeah. Where I'm hoping to impress upon these buyers that I'm the right person for that job. Sometimes I'm not. Right. The only thing I could do on my own that I knew I had control over is I could shoot it, I could put it in the computer, yep. I can manipulate it, and then I could present it to you guys, and you can have your opinion about that and make a decision whether or not you think it's good. Um, do you, I always, do you think that it's important for, for artists to, if, if someone is following some sort of freelance artist, uh, ice dropping excuse in the back, excuse us, um, uh, if, if someone's working as, you know, trying to get freelance artistic work, is it, did you find it was valuable the time you spent doing something in parallel with it? Like, did it fill that... That, sp that Everything creative sort of space for you. Digital, digital, like I'm saying, digital photography turned into digital video for me, which be began some relationships with me where I was producing documentaries. Right. Uh, again, that is, that developed an entire new skill set that I could use to lean on right. as a craft that could pay bills. Right. You know, so... 
these things are jobs now. Yeah, you know, right. Photography has become slightly, uh, I, just, I don't want to say disheartening because I really love how photography has become so ubiquitous, but everybody has a camera in their pocket. When everybody's on the, Instagram, it's kind of everybody's got their own museum. Everyone's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Photo everybody's a photographer. I'm sure you have an eye and you capture your life in a way that, you know, I, I, it, 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 it devalued m my own perception of my work. Yeah. You know, which probably pushed me harder to become, you know, I'm thinking, well, photography is as competitive as being an actor. I'm going to act again. You know, like, yeah, it's like right. that's where I'm going to yeah. put my efforts. You know, uh, one of the things that I think that freelancers have kind of as a question at all times is, okay, um, you know, I get all these opportunities that sort of come to me, and, but they want it for free. Right, they don't want to pay what this I deserve. This is a freelancer's bane. Yeah, I know. I mean, I mean graphic, graphic artists are f hilarious about this thing, and you could probably find a, just a ton of animatics yeah. about how clients want you to work for basically free, and they'll, the they'll come back to you. How great the experience is going to be for your career. So, but the qu the question I would have about that though is, how much is it that there might be an opportunity? There might be an opportunity that somebody might see that work. Well, it, the every, value that there might be there. Every photographer will tell you that the beginning two years or three years of your photography career, you're either paying Someone to do it. To do it, right? right. Literally. Right. Because you have to develop a, a lexicon of work where, that you can point to and say, you know, I've done all of these circumstances in different ways and uh, I did it with my own creativity. And then the next couple of, of levels, you're breaking even and paying for your gear. Yeah. Because your gear's going to cost you 30 grand over, you know, you become a slave to wanting the next thing that yeah. makes you good. But of course, we all know that one body and one lens will sustain. That's for more than enough. That's probably what Ansel of... Adams probably used. But, right. You know, pretty, pretty good body. Yeah, he probably did. Yeah, that 8 by 10 <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's true. It, building, uh, building your ability to get paid as a freelance photographer or or a graphic artist or a motion graphic artist or an editor, you're going to do a ton of work for the experience and that's just what you have to do. You and, have to do And it. you never know when some set of eyes might see that weird thing that you like did on like the two hours you had free on a Tuesday. Absolutely. And Absolutely. you're like, oh my God, I got discovered by this stupid thing that I did for free. Absolutely. In fact, there's a great story about Jimmy Iovine sweeping the, uh, I don't know if you guys watched. I uh, haven't watched uh, it. You love that. I love oh that. my Run. God. Incredible, incredible. The documentary in it. Oh, are HBO. we talking about the Slim Shady thing? Uh, it, yeah, it's the actually, Defiant it, Ones. It's, it's on the HBO. Defiant Ones. Jimmy four, Iovine. Right, but it was Jimmy Iovine so and Dr. Dre. Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre. Yeah. Right. Their backstories and then how they converge together. Interscope Records together. becomes, yeah. Right. And, you know, first started with, you know, first started with Interscope, how Dr. Dre, after, you know, after Death Row. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I, I, You're way into I'm a hip hop it. historian, I mean, apparently. Uh, but I after. Love I love it. He's <laughs> a great <laughs> documentary. You've got to go watch it. He regales me with his, how he did. I can rap, but I'm not going to do it. He did rap. Do not. At somebody's wedding or something like that. Uh, mine. You did, a, you did a rap at his home. I hear it all the My time. My beautiful wife, like, Karen, allowed me to be rap. Coming. Yeah. Yes, so. nothing but a G thing. That's, that was the thing. So anyway, so back to the story. They converged with Interscope, and then they talk about their journey going into, uh, you know, looking at uh, where they started Beats, right? And then they had the big payout, $3 billion. And what's interesting is, you know, Jimmy happened to be in the right place at the right time, right? And what they talk about is, you know, he was, he was basically an assistant, and he sweeping started floors. sweeping floors, oh, really? and, and, he was, and he was in an et bay and, and running tape, and oh, really? they asked him to come in on Easter Sunday, and everybody else took off, and it just so happened that because he said yes, he actually was the one who recorded John Lennon. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's exactly yeah, what exactly. I'm talking about. Right place, right time. That was so. kind of the story I was heading toward. It's, yeah. uh, that's exactly right. It, it's, really, it's really finding yourself in the world that you want to be in and finding how you fit into it and perhaps magical strike, something mm -hmm. like that. Or 
you develop the chops just by absorbing what great people can do around you. But, but now when you have an actual schedule of things potentially that right. you can be doing, right. uh, how does that change your decision-making process in terms of, you know, if someone brings you something really cool but it's free, or right. if uh, somebody... Those are, those are rare, but those are case by case. I mean, uh, uh, I was just producing a thing that I was going to shoot in New York, and, a, and if it had fallen through, I, a friend had offered me a short here in town. I love this kid. I'd never seen anything that he directed, but if, if the thing that I was going to New York to do had fallen through, I would have been in that immediately. Yeah. You've got to pay the bills first, so the thing that's going to pay the bills is the thing, but as you say, like, I'll wake up, I have, I'm either producing a documentary, I'm getting a, a treatment together for a series that I have uh, No grass is growing. With. You're not waiting for the next gig to come in. No, no. Just... Every morning you have to figure out, like, what is the groundwork I can lay for yeah. one of these great things? And if I have auditions to work on, that's, like, immediately first thing on my mind is get that work going like you want to be percolating all the time especially as an actor like you want to read the material enjoy it figure out how you fit into it and then the an actor's day is weird i always have to do something physical to keep my body in shape because that's kind of what you know that's, but that's important i think for any anybody who has a sole proprietor or some sort of for the, keeping a strong but i mean look i beat myself up about it all the time right but i i've even as i get older i'm starting to really re recognize that if i don't do some sort of work on my own physical body, I won't be in business much longer because I'll be in a wheelchair or in some bed someplace. We all have to think you of know it what that I mean? way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the first thing is health, right? And, and your family. Yeah. Uh, uh, but follow, uh, following the thing that drives you is, is going to fall into place certainly uh, yeah. next for me yeah. when I wake up. So when... Um, when you started, when things started to click more for you, like literally mm -hmm. where it's like, where you could relax a little bit more mm -hmm. than before. Was there something that somebody said to you that kind of said, you know, maybe you should change your style to this, or did you change anything that kind of like made everything's kind of like, oh shoot, now everything's kind of popping now? No, you know, I, in my, like in my 20s, I had a very easy time as an actor. I got great parts. I, I mean, I got great projects. I actually never really had a part that I felt demonstrated what I trained to do, which is a really interesting thing. As an actor, you know, the work isn't always good. Yeah. And you have to find a way to make it unique and interesting and feed yourself. Or pay you, you know. Do I do I say? Well. How, was that like lip, your lip service time? Or right, it? I was an MTV <laughs> DJ and he game was show host MTV in the MTV game show. How did you, I mean? But finding a way to make that even new every single day was that? Well, that was, incre I mean, that was an incredible experience. I was 23 years old, and they were giving me all the clothes I wanted, and it was like <laughs> four weeks every six months. I did 60 shows at a time, and it was very fast. And there were lots and lots and lots of screaming young people around, yeah. including the staff. Right. That was such a blast. I couldn't. It was in New York City. That was like a dream. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't acting, and then acting became like do a series, do a movie, get a part, do the next thing, and then I didn't have a family to pay for. Now I have a figure skater, 15-year-old daughter. Yeah, oh God, so uh, they have to pay for those blades. Uh, blades, boots, dresses, and, and yeah. a lot of uh, Russian coaches and really great uh, you know, people get to be part of her training, so that needs a lot. But, but was, there, was there something, but, though, that like recently or when, because you've, you've now was, had some, I mean, some really notable successes over the past couple of years. What I was leading towards yeah. was in my 30s, it, I was young looking. Okay, got it. And the roles weren't oh, got coming it. around for me. Got it, because there's all, a whole wealth of the youth and the young and all that kind right. of thing coming up. And I didn't look like a doctor. I didn't look like a father. I didn't got look it. like an attorney. And I had great representation, representation. And people were trying to hire me, but they kind of always leaned on, geez, you kind of don't look like these guys. So I left it a bit. Yeah. I kind of left acting behind. And I joined up with this group, the Stan Winston School. If you happen to be a makeup effects artist or a makeup effects enthusiast, you can find the Stan Winston School on Facebook. They're also online at stanwinstonschool.com. I was their creative director, and I produced and, and directed and post-produced all of the tutorial material 
on how to become a makeup effects artist or a sculptor or a designer and all these things. So I took seven years with these guys and created this school and dabbled at acting yeah. for seven years. I yeah. would kind of, I was in Silmar where the offices were, and if an audition came in, I kind of had to go, do I have the three hour round trip Oof, to yeah, get yeah. to Hollywood and back? Yeah. And if I didn't, I passed on a lot of stuff. Wow. So acting was taking a back seat. Wow. At, when self-taping came along, again, this is a way of being autonomous, I was able to put myself on tape and not leave the building. Got it. This is a new phenomenon in casting. If they can't get you in the room or they can't get you on the coast that they're on, you put yourself on tape and you give them your best representation of what you think the part is. Yeah. I got a couple of things. Yeah. And I happened to get a series with Dennis Leary and that is what, from that self-taping, Really? And after a couple of years of that, I realized that the school was suffering because I was dividing my time, and my acting was suffering because I was dividing my time, and I just said, I'm going to uh, focus. Yeah. You know? And I think that by focusing and by kind of leaning back and saying, I'm going to be 50. <laughs> yeah, right? You know? And if I'm not doing what really drives me, yeah. uh, maybe I'm not giving it the shot I yeah. need to. So I'm lucky right now that people are paying attention and that I have good parts to audition for and, and good parts to play. Did you, when did you kind of feel that it was, it was a good time to say, oh, you know, it's time to get my day job? Or have you ever felt that? No, I still have 18 Because everybody has jobs. these kind of like, you know, everybody's got their side hustle now. Yeah. You know? I mean, for me, it's still, for me, it's now creating stuff that's for me and my... And, and so it's just the nature of the side hustle or the day job yeah. is kind of changed. I mean, I love education and I love working with that team and I love working with the makeup effects artists in California. They're all incredible artists. Yeah. Incredible. But I was feeding, I was feeding an entire, entirely other industry, one that I wasn't born to be a part of really. Right. And that was a long time coming. And those guys are kind of coasting along doing a great job now and they didn't need me as much. Because right. I created all the processes there with them. Right, right. And, not, and then... You kind of the built the car and they're, years, they're it driving it. It seemed like I was watching them kind of jam. Got and it. I was kind of like, oh, I'm slowing down here. Mm. Got it. So Got it. I'm happiest when I'm driving a team and when I'm driving my own work forward. And Got it. Got it. Well, you know, I want to uh, start kind of bringing Vahan into this whole conversation. Talk money! It's, let's, you know... We've got, you know, when you have, uh, you go from gig to gig and you get these kind of large chunks of money that are kind of sporadic or they're going, you know, two or three a year. Uh, well, I mean, what do you do for, for clients that come to you with that kind of issue in terms of finding the best way to get the best out of it, to, you know, really maximize deductions, that kind of thing? So when, when you're in the gig economy and especially in entertainment and you're going after your passion, whether it's photography, acting, or uh, producing, um, you just follow your passion. You really don't think about taxes. The last thing you want to think about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Yes, it is. It's, it's more I mean, of a pain. <laughs> And also your financial affairs, it's easy to overlook because you're so focused on your passion. But, you know, unfortunately, we need to deal with that. So, um, and it's very important to pay some attention to it um, or work with a professional to help you kind of put the finance affairs in place and um, help you uh, you know, run your things tax efficient. Right. So um, tax planning is very important. It's especially if you have deductions, you don't have income, and then all of a sudden you have big income, you know, you may end up you know, paying more tax than, uh, you know, if you did some tax planning. So it's important to do things ahead of time, think about it on a continuous basis, maybe have a, a budget run, uh, when you're expecting some income, you have to budget it in, and then you have your, you know, your expenses. You want to make sure, um, you know, you're within the budget, and you're able to save uh, some money uh, for, let's say, if you want to buy real estate, start investing. Then, you know, the planning a couple years ahead of time really helps you um, to um, kind of plan for a major transaction or a major purchase. Got it. Uh, if you don't do planning, you may kind of be surprised and all of a sudden you, you see a nice house you want to buy. Yeah. You don't have enough savings. Right. And, and your tax return doesn't look 
I mean, I think that that's sure, so, no. sometimes a big surprise is that they'll get, you know, let's say, you know, 200 grand or something for a job. And then it's like, ooh, ooh we got 200 grand. And they spend all 200 and then, oh, wait a minute. At the end of the year, I didn't save up my quarterlies. I didn't do, you know, all the stuff to kind of get myself prepared for what happens at the end of the year. Right? Yes, yes, correct. So that's why planning is very important. Um, and, but you also want to do tax efficient planning. So, right. Um, you know, have, what is that? What do you mean by like, what does that entail? Um, you want to make sure uh, you're uh, taking all the deductions you're entitled to, depending on whatever you're, you're doing to make money. Um, uh, you want to maybe make your income consistent to avoid spikes in um, income so you don't end up in higher tax brackets. Um, uh, you know, you, in, depending, uh, you, know, you may need to accelerate or defer some income depending where you want to be. Got it. Uh, so that all of this helps with the tax efficiency. Got it. Got it. Now, if, um, let's say that, you know, I know that when I was uh, starting to, um, you know, when I was in visual effects as a visual effects producer, and uh, the one of the big pain points I had was, sh you know, basically uh, saving, uh, getting a, a lender to, to loan to me because I didn't have a, uh, a lender, uh, sorry, a uh, employment uh, record. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, I'd be going to job, to job, to job. Um, is, what would you be, how would you be kind of, and this is also a question for you, Ron, as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would be the best way to kind of, uh, maybe you, want, you wouldn't want to like get all your deductions because then it might lower your income, wouldn't it? And make it, make it difficult for you to qualify for a house. Correct. Correct. So you got to be careful what, what you're planning to do, right? So um, this is where acceleration and, and deferral of income comes into play. And these are legit tax strategies. And if you're equipment in, intensive, you know, if you're in production, you buy a lot of equipment and gear, there's, you can take depreciation. And depreciation you know, it can be a little bit flexible. Right. And it's also an outback for lenders when they're calculating your cash flow. So it's one way to reduce your uh, taxable income, pay, pay little tax, but at the same time your cash flow will look good uh, and you, you'll qualify for a loan. Uh, so a big challenge is the inconsistency yeah. in, in getting the income in. So right. the, as, as self-employed freelancer, usually you're under a special you know, uh, on the writing guidelines, and Ron can tell about it uh, a little more. From accounting and tax standpoint, uh, and planning standpoint, I'll say you want to make things consistent. Yeah. So, uh, did you, John? Did you run into this issue? I know that you don't you don't own now, but when you did purchase back then, did you run into any issue with basically showing the difference? Employment. Uh, I became, history. I became uh, incorporated fairly early. Uh, um, which proved to be slightly expensive in the quieter years when I wasn't getting paid it can so be, much. It can be, actually, as I, I have a corporation as well. Yeah. And when you're paying that $800 every kind of... Quarter. Yeah, yeah it's kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus the, plus the extra accounting fees, which Yeah, are, right. So um, I'll say uh, it, it, it has a little bit cost to maintain it, but at the same time, as, as corporations, uh, usually the loan-out corps are S-corps, there's a nice uh, tax yeah. savings um, uh, tool there where you, know, you have to issue yourself reasonable salary. And then after you get the reasonable salary, what's left, you distribute yourself uh, uh, the remaining income, and that's not subject to payroll tax. So there's right. a little bit of payroll tax savings that most of the time it actually compensates for the keep up fees Costs, and yeah. actually the, it even it. saves you more. Got so, it. Right. Um, and, and at the same time, it also gives you the consistency uh, because you can issue yourself salary on a consistent basis, um, even though your income comes in in different chunks. Right. You're right. Getting a consistent salary. Well, yeah, as an actor, that does get confusing, especially when you're new and you. It, 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 I mean, I know you say the word the 200,000, which is fantastic, <laughs> but uh, uh, that doesn't happen so often. Uh, let's just say you do a guest I just star assumed, top Don. of show. I just assume that you are literally, you. that you go home at night and you ro put the money on your bed and you roll, <laughs> roll back and it. forth on but the money. Typically, you do a Facebook Live yes. and you don't wear all your clothes. But, yes. but no, uh, w you know, between six and 20 grand for, for a week's 
episodic work, which doesn't come all that often. And so when it does come, the government, if you're not incorporated, takes away a gigantic chunk of that and you end up with almost nothing. And you're like, and plus you pay your agent, yeah. your, your manager, and you're, you come up with nothing. And of course, if you have someone smart looking after you, you get all of it now and you distribute as you would suggest. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, right. yeah, there is a there is tax side to everything, so right. you always want to pay attention to how at the end this is going to affect my tax. Do you recommend like a biz filings or someone like that to do that incorporation, and then you oversee the final details, or would you hire an attorney to do that for you? Or um, it depends. If you want something simple, um, bo boilerplate, you know, bylaws, um, the biz filings. Something like Legal Zoom can can do it. Really uh, inexpensive there, really, yeah. Yeah, and that would be the inexpensive version. But if you want something more tailored and sophisticated, you definitely want and to go with an attorney. You know, because yeah. my I'm going to interject here with the wife that's an attorney. Yeah, she would definitely probably want us to say that yes, there's, there attorney. are things though, like you go with Legal Zoom and things like that, and they do work. But everybody's uh, situation is so specific yeah. that right. it's, you, whenever you go that way you start to risk those kind of issues so, yeah um, but you it's it's better if you can go oh, I did it way phone. before these other services yeah, even right. existed so I had before yeah. there was an internet actually yes yeah right uh, <laughs> and, and, yeah I mean I, let's just be blunt yeah and yes the attorneys it, it could cost you a little bit more up front but then you're more covered as far as you know ad, like addressing your risk yes yeah, and recourse yeah. too a little closer to the mic there, my friend. Uh -huh. Thank you That's very good. much. Well, actually, uh, give it over to Ron here for a second because... Um, so I'm going to demonstrate on how to hold the mic. Yeah, right, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. How to, this is how we do it. We, we do it, it like, right here. Like, um, right here. I probably have to hold it lower. No, I'm good. Jason? All right. Jason All right. says I'm Jason good. Jason is uh, running our board again. That's a round of applause Fantastic. for Jason, everybody. Woo! Woo! Thank yeah. you, Jason. 1987, um, Birmingham High. Birmingham High. He also Birmingham did not High. go to our 30th reunion. And I can't even say what, Braves what, 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 anymore. They're the Patriots. Patriots. They're the Patriots. Patriots. Birmingham, the Patriots. Patriots. Yeah. Braves. Braves. Oh, Braves. Some people Braves. are clinging to that, and they're actually selling the Braves t-shirt, uh, sweatshirt online. I thought that was interesting. I don't have any comment about that. <laughs> when it comes to mascots, <laughs> I like so the Braves better than, better than the Patriots. So right. there, there yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I quite quite, quite the stand you're taking there, Ron. So, okay, so yes. what, what do we do? What, what do you, when you have someone who is getting, you know, clumps of money like this in different... Yep. What, what do you advise them in terms of getting loans for homes, let's say? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, I love this guy. I think Fahan's amazing. We're always at ends yeah. when it comes to looking at someone's income and how we qualify them. So a CPA's job is to maximize deductions so that you pay as little tax as possible. And as a lender, we need the borrower to show as much income as possible so that you qualify for a home loan. Right. And when you work with the CPA, you maximize the deductions and there's no income there, you're gonna pay for it one way or the other, right? Right. So you're either gonna do a bank statement program where we're actually going to look at the net deposits from your business, where you show all the deposits that are coming in and then all the you know, withdrawals going out and then what you pay yourself. And yeah, it's a little higher, right? So there's a little more risk involved, right? right? right. Or we're gonna qualify off of your assets or you're gonna get a hard money loan and pay 10%. There's, there's, there's no easy silver bullet. The key is you want to have a nice balance so that, yeah, you are going to have to pay some taxes. You are going to have to show some income, but you're going to get a pretty great rate, yeah. right? So you, you have those, those, those two sides. Now, as far as... Well, can I yeah. stop here for post, uh, pause for one second? Yeah, here. because I didn't understand any of that. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't? I did. I okay, good. Is it a foregone conclusion that someone who's a freelancer or, or, or uh, uh, you know, their cell phone, you know, they have a, their own business or whatever, mm -hmm. is, is it a foregone conclusion that they're going to have a higher rate? Because no, they... no, 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 no. So first of all, you know, there isn't, there, there isn't bias, you know, so the underwriter doesn't look at, you know, oh, they're a freelancer, they're an actor, we're going to give them, you know, they have to pay the higher rate, right? right? Because we see them as unstable. The underwriter, they are an uninterested third party, right? They, they look at everybody the exact same. They're just looking at numbers. Right. Right. So 
when we look at someone's income, you know, the underwriter, what's really key is they want to look at consistency and continuity, right? right? If everybody could make $200,000 a year, which is fantastic, as W-2. John does all the time. And works for Still XYZ like company <laughs> and doesn't take any deductions, everything is very smooth, and we're just able to plug that information into our system, then that's beautiful. Now, especially in California, not everybody operates that way, right? right? People have side hustles, right. ha side gigs. Right. The number of freelancers is actually increasing year over year. Right. And the number of freelancers that are actually making more than $100,000 has gone up significantly, right? Okay. So I just saw that statistic, which was pretty cool, right? So, you know, go, go freelancers. Go freelancers. Go freelancers. So with all of that, what we look at is if you have the benefit where you know that you're, you're catching wind, you're starting to you know, really get into that point where your income is increasing, you're building your craft, you need to talk to the CPA. And if home ownership is on your horizon, you need to talk to a lender, right? right? And you need to have that combined conversation and way between those two because, you know, first of all, you know, I, I never suggest that someone should incorporate a certain way to get a loan because when it comes to lending a home, it's very important. It's a, the most important asset. However, how you're set up as a business is number one. Yeah. That's priority number one because that affects your family. That affects your, you know, how you actually live your life and pay your expenses and everything else. So number one would be set up your business, right? Whether you are a sole proprietor, and you're reporting your income on Schedule C on your, on your ta you know, personal tax return, and you're taking deductions that way, you're reporting all your income on the first page as wages, right? So you're getting 20 W-2s and 1099s and all that. Or you have an S-Corp and you have a, a C-Corp where now you're a little more sophisticated and you really are a business where you're, and that ice is awesome. So, your E28. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Bingo. So, so when it comes to the, you know, setting up your business, that's number one. The next step is let's at least get a baseline to see where you are, right? Yeah. So when, when I talk to clients and when Tom refers business over to me, I, you know, we, we get a baseline, you know? So the idea is that, okay, we wanna make, you know, we wanna buy a home for $750,000, we have $200,000 to put down. Let's see if that's possible. And we go through and, and, and we just, you know, put it in the matrix and see, is that gonna work? And, you know, sometimes there's gray area, right? So not all the time does it fit perfectly within the box. And then we need to be creative and we need to look back at, you know, add backs and depreciation and all those types of things. But what's exciting is, you know, in the past, and, and Tom, you've, you've shared this multiple times yeah. on the podcast, yeah. you know, I mean, the whole, re one of the reasons why you started this was because you were out looking for a home and yeah. you were trying to get qualified as a freelancer yeah. and you're getting turned down because right. your income was reliant upon going dig gig to gig. And if a, if a underwriter is looking at consistency and continuity, they're going to match up. They want to match up your work at Universal and your work at Disney and, you know, all these other companies around here. And they want to see that you're going from, you know, this company to that company and this company, to that right. company and this company, and then issue all those verifications of employment, right, yeah. and all that stuff. Right. So they want that, but that's not how things work, right? You have multiple gigs. And by the time you're ready to buy that home and make the offer, you might not have a gig. Yeah. Right. So you can't align the stars perfectly. And that's what's exciting because there's new ways on how to qualify that income. Right. You know, I would say the, you know, the light bulb went off when I saw this guideline at my company that said uh, freelancers, entertainment professionals that are dependent upon, you know, multiple W-2s we treat that income similar to how we treat commission income. Right. And what I mean by that is if you make $150,000 in 2015 in aggregate, and then in 2016 you make $200,000, well, we're going to average those two years, and we're going to say you make $175,000, and your business is you are an actor. 
right? right? right. And that is your business. Even though you're getting all these W-2s, we're not matching them up from, you know, from gig to gig, and we're not asking for verifications of employment. What we're asking for is just to establish that track record. Right. Now, you can't do it just for a year. Right. right. So it's two years similar to commission. But man, that's that's so freeing to be able to, you know, because if you think about it, I mean, John, you were talking about it, like if you make six to twenty thousand dollars in what, a week or, right. or two weeks, right. it's a lot more than someone who's working at the DM, you know, no, no offense, but working at the DMV. <laughs> oh, we just lost the DMV. 13, there are trade offs. Earning thirteen hundred, <laughs> earning thirteen hundred dollars every two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And, Spread that you know, out. and underwriters are like, oh, man, I want, you know, I'm going to do that loan. Right. Because it's stable and consistent. But right. I mean, six to twenty thousand dollars. That's a nice pop. Right? right. So you're making more money per day than uh, most people are all year, but just because your income isn't paid on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly right. basis, there's that stigma, and that's what we're trying to break down. And that's really why we're here in terms of talking about not just acting, but also freelancers, period, who, you know, the project comes in, and it's a huge project, and they, you know, have to make ends meet for the next six months until the next big project comes mm -hmm. in. Right. And it's not necessarily, you know, they, maybe they want to buy a house in between that time, or they want to do something, they have to buy, they have some sort of capital outlay they have to make that, you know, they have to find the place to make that work in tax-wise for them. But the key so, is most of these gigs end. Yes. Whereas you're looking at a, someone you're not who's, getting employee, a weekly paycheck. who's an employee is getting a weekly thing that has ongoing potential, right. not only potential, but a promise. Yeah. Yeah, it's a different world. Definitely. So uh, I, we're kind of getting, I want to get to the, uh, if there's any kind of questions, if anybody here in the audience has any questions uh, in terms of freelancers uh, who want to ask a question to any of our experts up here, I'd love to put it out there. I want to bring as much value as I possibly can uh, for the folks who are here. Uh, any questions online? Ron. Yeah, we actually have a question here. This one's from Tim. He already took off. But Tim, he, yeah. He, he said, what if a freelancer has a successful and recurring role? Does the reoccurrence positively influence the underwriter during the mortgage process? That's a good question. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, we're human, right? right. And the underwriter is human, but they're not su supposed to show bias to anybody. Right. Right? So, if, you know, if, if Kate Winslet applied for a loan, we have to treat Kate just like anybody else. Right. And I mean, I, I, I've had that situation, right, where I've worked with either extremely wealthy individuals or working with um, actors and actresses that are well known, you know, A-list, what have you. But yeah, they have to sign loan docs just like everybody else. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's no special treatment. I had, I mean, talk about, you know, working with people that are self-employed. I worked with one client where he was buying a home for his daughter. I think it was like a two or three million dollar property. And he was buying it as, as an investment property. And he had 151 K1s. Ooh, my Lord. And because he had massive losses in some of these companies and showed also humongous gains, but the ownership percentage in all of those companies, it varied across the spectrum. I couldn't just look at him and say, I Googled this guy and he's worth $100 million. Like, how could you not qualify this guy? No, you have to qualify him. I have to go through all those K-1s because guess what? Yeah, in the paper, he might be worth $100 million, but he might not be worth all that much or in right. terms of income or anything else. You have to go to that standard. It's not, you look at the person and say, oh yeah, they're good. Right. There's, mm. there's no playing favorites or there's no, yeah. All right. Well, on that note, on a final drop of ice, we're going to go ahead and That's wrap right. this up. <laughs> Vahan, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. John, so glad to see the amazing success that you're having. I'm so uh, proud of you. I can't even begin to tell you, you how amazing uh, proud I am this of you. great to be a part of it. I learned a lot. Uh, okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and if you don't mind, guys, I'm going to read this just so I have it. If you oh, have any God. questions or comments, please don't hesitate to leave them for our, us on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash clarified realty podcast, all one word. Uh, if you have any questions about real estate or you're looking for someone to help you buy or sell a home, remember, I'm actually a licensed real estate agent. I'd love to help you out. So please email me directly at Tom at clarifiedrealty.com or give me a call at 818-335-7662. Don't be shy. Come on, guys. Give me a ring. Uh, for more exclusive bonus content and advice between episodes, please check out our website, 
You didn't catch me on that. <laughs> www.clarifyrealty.com. I got spelling. John actually watching my performance over my shoulder, so I'm worried about it. Also on our homepage, you'll find links to helpful buyer and seller guides that can give you some great information for starting your home buying or home seller process. So definitely check those out. I'm on Snapchat, Twitter, and Instagram as well. My handle for all three of those is our at Clarified Realty. Please leave feedback and reviews on iTunes or in, com uh, in the comment section on our page. Together we're stronger. So if you have any questions or ways that we can make this podcast better, please let us know. And uh, my amazing theme song, Hey Now, is from the band Wolf. That's Wolf with two Fs. And please go check them out and like them on SoundCloud. They rock so freaking hard, they invented the gig economy, if you know what I mean. And just a little disclaimer, I'm licensed by the California Bureau of Real Estate. My license number is 0171 Ron's is. Guaranteed rate, NMLS ID 2611, NMLS 558706, California. The advice we give is only for properties located in the state of California. For all other states, please contact your local real estate agent or real estate professional. That's it. You, Ron, you all good? Yeah, I'm good, Tom. All right. Well, thanks for coming by, everybody. And remember, the greatest yes. thing you can ever do is make someone feel at home. When Thank do you we so start? much. <laughs> oh, no. What you gonna do with your life?